the rhino is synonymous with Africa, one of the big five game animals. However, despite having no natural predators, this magnificent animal may now be coming to the end of the road. The statistics for South Africa alone, home to 80% of the world's 29,000 rhinos, paint a bleak picture. In 2008, the South African government banned the legal trading of rhino horn. The result was an explosion of poaching. From 13 rhinos in 2007, 333 were killed in 2010, 668 in 2012, and 1,215 in 2014. Since 2014, poaching has averaged over 1,000 rhinos a year, with 4,026 killed between 2015 and 2018. This is the face of poaching. The horn has been hacked off while the animal was still alive. It had to be put down by field rangers. This scene has been repeated thousands of times. The question is, why is this happening? What makes the rhino horn so valuable for poachers to commit these atrocities? We traveled to Gravelot in South Africa and spoke to well-known private rhino conservancy owner, Pete Warren. It is a, it is a, a, a very old tradition, Chinese tradition. And when I asked a, a Chinese the other day, why does he have to have a rhino horn? He asked me the question, does your wife have a diamond ring? I said, yes. And how much did it cost? I said, a bloody fortune. He said, now, we in China don't value diamonds. It's not part of our culture, but we value rhino horn. Why do you question our culture? We don't question your diamond culture. We've got nothing to do with it. Who told you that piece of compressed stone was worth 2 million, 10 million, 3 million? Uh, the one in the Queen's uh, uh, crown is worth, I wouldn't say billions, but many, many millions of pounds. Why would you question that. Why do you, why do you question that? I had no answer. So he said, we want to trade rhino horn. We, it's part of our culture. We use it constantly. Uh, 10 years ago, our rhino numbers were increasing. We had 20, 21,000 rhinos. Most of them in government-owned uh, game reserve, parks, protection units. Now, these have been depleted. They have sold many rhinos to private owners, like myself, which I, I, we bought over years. And some of us believed in it and collected it. We then created a private rhino organization which is now hard at work to legalize the rhino horn. We are not getting 
much support from the government because uh, of various unknown reasons. But the logic of it all is that plain and simple, a rhino is worth four, five times more dead than alive. Now, if you can, if once it's killed, the rhino horn internally in South Africa will sell for 50,000 rand. The poaching price per kilo, the poaching price per kilo is well over 100,000. The Chinese price is $20,000, which gives you 300,000 rand per kilo. So if you legalize the horn, conservancies like mine would opt to sell their horn because what you must understand, the horn grows constantly. So if you cut it off, after three years, it has grown out it grows at about four inches a year. So after three years, you have a 10, 12, 14 inch long horn, which you can cut off and, and deliver to the Chinese market, which would satisfy their need. Instead of allowing this unbelievable stupidity of having the rhinos poached, Pete further explained the security measures on his farm. Okay, the, uh, it's no use after they have killed the rhino. Then there's no use uh, in getting uh, cross and getting excited and changing. You have to take, you have to preempt the attack. Now, you must remember we are only 50 kilometers from the Kruger National Park, which is only 80 kilometers from the Mozambican border. Now that is the gateway to the rhino horn smuggling. So where we are here is not the most ideal place to manage and farm rhinos. So, I tried it, when I started off, I just uh, had game fencing and managed them as such. It was a total disaster. Security guards, uh, day and night, all of that could not protect the rhinos. So, I have created 10 foot fencing with alarms and the total 32 fences, wires, are it, excuse me, electrified. And as soon as you touch or short one of the out, it sends a signal to the, the security personnel who react, react immediately. The whole farm is divided into zones. So the minute that they get it, a call from a certain zone, they know exactly where to go to. And they will react and go straight to that call, to that point. Now, what we have had is that people have come with ladders and uh, uh, they have dug holes underneath the fence. Now, we have changed the fence to accommodate those entry systems and to preempt the strikes. So presently we've ha we have had 19 months of poaching free. We have not lost one rhino to poachers. It's a war out there and there's an army of rangers trying to keep the poachers at bay. We visited the Southern African Wildlife College in Pumalanga where the field rangers are being trained and asked the facilitator, Colonel Elton Stone, about the course and training and the type of weapons the field rangers have to be prepared for. 
The safety measures that private conservationists have to implement are eye-wateringly expensive. They get no funding from the government. Field rangers, we uh, assist uh, Botswana, uh, Zimbabwe. There are other countries further up north in Africa, which we also assist. Um, it is because we are sharing a, a common uh, uh, concern, and that is poaching. Of course, it's six weeks, and uh, we try to cover everything uh, possible to make sure that uh, the quality of ranger that we send back onto the ground knows exactly and is uh, trained according to the situation. All the weapons you see as training aids, there's actually no firearm, that's a real, a real firearm. This is painted in blue to show it's a training aid, it's got no threat at all. And then only once we have achieved the, the, the required results from there, we take them to the FN or the R1, which is a 7.65 or a 308, which is the UM. And um, that's the guns they're gonna, most of them will work with in the in entire life when they do anti-poaching and so forth. You cannot go with a sassy gun to go and fight the, anti the, the poaching guys because they come with everything they have. Normally it's an AK-47 or even bigger than that uh, when it comes to hunting rifles like a 375 or a 458. So you can't play around with those guys. They didn't come to your party to drink tea. They are there to poach and you need to stop them. Threat must be treated with threat. However, there is a solution. The obstacle really at this point is political will. Um, and that's it. Um, there is a perceived set of obstacles that I um, don't believe are real. So there is, of course, this notion that CITES precludes the legal trade um, in Rhino Horn internationally. Um, and that's actually not correct. Um, uh, very commonly held misperception. So CITES does not prohibit the trade. CITES merely regulates the trade um, and attempts to um, prohibit the purely commercial trade, except if it's captive. Is that it allows trade if. So if you are doing the hard work of bringing more of these animals into the world, um, then CITES rewards you by allowing you to trade. Um, and there are some fairly strict guidelines as to what qualifies for a captive breeding operation from the wild. Because what we want to do is protect the wild stocks. And the best way to do that um, is a two-pronged approach of uh, ensure that they are not taken from the wild and satisfy the demand that humans have, uh, have for the product um, you know, through other means. And in rhino, it's one of the most beautiful situations because unlike other animals where um, harvesting the value for human beings requires the demise of the animal, with rhino we dehorn them anyway to keep them from killing each other because we want them all to thrive and rhino in, uh, themselves uh, want just the individual animal to survive. Um, so we dehorn them anyway, we're staring at a pile of horn um, and protecting them from poachers who will kill them for the stump. Uh, that horn grows back and that's the most important thing people don't know is that the horn grows constantly. The only reason it's sharp to a point instead of growing out for meters is because the rhino constantly grinds it against rocks and stones and tree tr tree stumps and whatnot um, to grind it to a sharp dangerous point so that it, it can inflict damage on other rhino. There's no real predation of a rhino um, so it's not protecting itself from a hyena or a jackal. We were lucky to be on the farm while a dehorning was taking place. Um, to dart the rhino is actually quite, quite. It's, that's why I do what I do, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to go up in a helicopter, uh, we're going to identify the specific animal we want to dart, we want to dart bulls. So I'm going to look for an animal with a, it's like a skin fold between the back legs going down, so that's how we can ID that it's a bull and not a female. Um, and then uh, I'll make up a dart with uh, a concentrated morphine uh, and then some other stuff in a dart. Um, on which I will dart the animal from the helicopter. Um, it's easier than it sounds. Um, uh, we'll ID the animal, we'll go in, dart and go out with, uh, with, with less than two minutes. So it's, it's, it's not a lot of stress on the animal um, and once the dart is in then we will with, we'll go away with the helicopter until we wait for the dart to take effect. It only takes about three minutes, four minutes. Um, some guys put other mixtures into the dart and makes it a bit quicker but I don't like it. I like my stuff to be controlled. So about four minutes the animal will be stationary and you can put a blindfold over the eyes. <clears throat> Once we see the animal is getting affected we'll just push it slightly over the helicopter towards the road so it's easier to work with. Then we'll blindfold the animal and then the animal will be down about six minutes, the animal will be down on the ground. Then to de we use a saw with a blade. <clears throat> so the horn is basically a nail 
so there's, there's no no feeling in it so it's, okay. it's like clipping your nails so we know where the growth plate is inside the horn so we'll we'll go above the growth plate and then make a clean cut through the horn um, there's no blood um, there's no pain in it. I've seen a rhino with a correct dehorning procedure happening, but it was in pain afterwards. And to cut the horn with a saw, the whole procedure from animal down to animal up again can be 15 minutes. If you've got a team that know it, know what's, uh, what's happening. Okay. And then <coughs> I don't trim the side of the horn, like a lot of guys now trim the sides of the horn as well, to get closer to, the, uh, to, to take as much horn off as we can. I don't like it, I like a little bit more protection around my growth plate. And that also helps when the horn grows out again. That, that new horn growing out, that it's uh, within two years you can almost not see that the animal was the horn. Every horn that we take off the must have a, a, a specific uh, microchip number, mm -hmm. identification number. So once the horn is off, uh, we must have uh, uh, the park spot must be here. So we can uh, they measure the horns, so weigh the horns, and we do put the microchip in, which gets sealed inside the horn. So each horn is identifiable in the future as well. Okay. So it's not as if we're cutting off horns and they can disappear into the system. They get a specific uh, number allocated by the government. The irony is that this approach could easily meet Asian market demand for rhino horn. Dehorning only 10% of rhinos in South Africa each year would deliver the estimated 2 to 3,000 horns consumed annually in an ethical manner and disincentivize the need for poaching. It seems like a sensible solution, so why do we still have this problem? We are Save the Rhino in London for comment. They declined a request for an interview, but sent us their position paper, which states that while they see the advantage of dehorning, they feel educating people should take priority. While this approach is laudable, it would mean changing a centuries-old culture of one and a half billion people. There is a solution where we neither try to affect a culture change nor encourage the poaching of rhinos, and that's the legalization of trade in ethically and sustainably produced rhino horns. The present situation, we've lost now 8,000. Are we going to wait till they're extinct? Are we, or are we going to stand up and say, no, 